All right. It's Thursday. It's 4 o'clock here in Alabama. It's time for the Real Estate Happy Hour. We're here. We're back on again. Uh, it's Thursday. And you can't touch this. You can't touch this. This is a uh, this is a special song for one of, a friend of mine here. What are you, Casey uh, Kasem? Oh, we just missed it. Uh, it's, oh, it's Tammy sorry. time. Oh, Tammy time. Tammy Hall. All right. It's, it's funny, so she'll uh, get it. Um, it's Tammy time. Yeah. Mmm. Uh, Go. MC Hammer. Everybody loves little MC Hammer, hey, huh? who doesn't love you MC Hammer? You can't touch this. I mean, you wear pants still like him. You can't touch this. Mmm. It's Tammy time. Oh, you gotta love it. Who doesn't love Cassie's it? Cassie's on. Karen's on. The birthday girl. Karen yep, Charles, right. she is 48 today, so good to good to know that. Uh, you didn't. She's not going to appreciate that. 38. Oh. Well, 38. Who knew, right? But anyway, hey, who doesn't love a little MC Hammer? Who doesn't love a little MC Hammer? Uh, Carter's going to have a tough time with that one tomorrow at the office. Absolutely. Hey, there's the king of all new home, Bob Schultz. How are you? Hope you're doing well. One of the best trainers in all of North America for new home sales, Bob Schultz. Good to see you, man. Uh, one of the best programs I ever went through. For Let's New get Home back South. on here live. We're going to dial in, see what's going on. All right. All right. You ready to rock and yeah, roll? So Man. Yeah, so we've got, uh, yeah, I was a little under the weather last week. Uh, just had a bad attitude. I'm just kidding. <laughs> bad hey, attitude. Hey, he was out of town, too, so I was like, well, you know what? He, he was rocking from Key West, so we didn't have anything yeah, to worry yeah, about. Yeah, I, 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 I was sick of having too much fun. Sick of having fun. Well, not really. Yeah. No, you, I was trying to make you make a little pun there, but it didn't work. But man, we got some good stuff. We got some mortgage stuff. We've got uh, a, a good little, time. little tip on on credit that came up this week. So I just I like talking about stuff that happens uh, right now. We've got some trends, home buyers and sellers. Talk a little bit about the market. It is December. It is cold outside, and I, I still haven't bought a single gift. So we're rolling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the sad part is my wife wants a new house. Right. Oh, well, that'd be yeah. But that's, that's just one big gift. But unfortunately, well, you're my lender, and and I don't want to pay off your mortgage. You know, I I would hurt your feelings if I paid it off. You know. Oh yeah. I mean, so I can't do we'll it. Just get you a new one. That's right. That's right. Don't tell her that. You know uh, what? You know, if you're ever having a a, a tough day, right, it always makes you feel better to refinance. That's right. Always. That's right. No, no. I did, and you know what's funny is we stepped down as interest rates came down. I started with a thirty one payment. It went to 20, same payment. 15 year, same payment. It was incredible. Now, it's, it is funny. Uh, ben Chenault and I did have this joke uh, years ago. Um, and obviously, not doing a whole lot of refinance right now, but we used to say all the time, oh, yeah. well, it, it, if you want to make yourself feel better, just refinance. Hey, just, yeah, it makes you hey, feel so better. We're, we're covering all kinds of people. We've got David Rocker showed up. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, Mike Hewlin in the house. Yeah. Well, anyway, hey, you know what's funny? The other night we were watching, before we get into real estate, huh? everybody knows we, 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 we're kind of full of uh, just random facts here at the top of the show. But watching a, a uh, I got it curious, you, Julia, our nine-year-old, loves that show, uh, The Greatest Showman. Yes. And so, you know, of course, the eternal pessimist that I am about movies, are they true or are they not true? I start, I, I said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit there and I'm going to watch uh, uh, a thing on P.T. Barnum. And what was fascinating was a ton of the sayings that we have in our culture today. <laughs> Who knew? They came straight from P.T. Barnum. And I wanted to share them with you a little bit. Uh, and now, right, right about what time was this? No, uh, been mid-1800s. Mid-1800s. Okay. Right, so so it's, not, it's not... Like, I, I guess growing up, I thought he was still alive. You know, because obviously they're on tour, right? Is but Barnum Brothers Ringling Circus, Ringling right? Brothers, Barnum Ringling, and Bailey. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. All right, anyway, the term jumbo, jumbo mortgage, jumbo shrimp, just the term jumbo. Yeah. Derived out of he had an elephant named Jumbo the Elephant. Jumbo the Elephant. So everything oversized. It was oversized. Became and jumbo. so they came jumbo. The nice. term the next one was the term hold your horses came from P.T. Barnum. When he when he would be going through obviously in the mid eighteen hundreds you didn't have David. If you see David on two eighty, he's doing you know, he's doing this all the way down. Um that's not what it's was traffic happening. Traffic patterns. Yeah, that's all. Yep, you're going following the traffic. But anyway, uh, basically, horse and buggies were in the way. Right. So and he's, he's coming through on elephants, right? With elephants through parading so through the streets. So, so, so hold your horses. I'm coming through. Hold your horse. Pretty fascinating, yeah, huh? Pretty good. Next one. Throw in their hat in the ring. We hear it all around election time, and that's exactly what happened at one of the circuses. Somebody yeah. threw their hat in the ring. A politician was having so much fun. Yeah, and and you, and you think about these things now, it makes sense, right? Obviously, all these are circus jargon. If you will, 
They are really. So it makes yep. sense if you're explaining it, but you don't you don't stop to think that. And the next one, jump on the bandwagon. <laughs> I mean, how many times have we heard it? And never just on. You know, I wonder where that came from. Well, I read this funny that it's the wagon that carried a circus band, so it's actually a wagon for the band. It's a band wagon. Yeah, and this is not like your marching band. These are like a yeah. bunch of freaks that play instruments, right? I right. would think. I, I don't have. I mean, for him, I, you know. Anyway, and the last one was uh, grandstanding. How often do we hear that in politics today? This is where this is where Collier would be. This is the VIP seats, <laughs> the VIP grandstand seats, and they would yeah. say, "Hey, look at those VIPs grandstanding. Look at those elitists over there." Anyway, I, I just want to share Collier. that with. I just want to share that with you. I thought it was interesting. Well, Mitchell, uh, thank you for that information. UAB refinanced Coach Clark's contract, winning all kinds of Coach of the Year awards. How long did they extend that? Uh, they needed to extend it for a long time because that man yeah. did a phenomenal job at the University of Alabama. Did a great Birmingham. job. I really wanted to see him beat A and M, but A and M played tough. That, that oh, it's just like Sanford year. did with FSU going down the stretch. I mean, just too tough. I mean, uh, and plus and, it, Mitchell is probably the Mitchell Miller is probably the fan of the year for them. And I apologize for for missing this uh, <laughs> until now, but I know everybody is on the edge of their seat. Highest paid coach in our conference now. I know everybody's on the edge of their seat for the new Georgia Tech coach. Jeff Collins. Oh, hey, well, everybody's just worried about that. Uh, listen, coming from Temple, you can rest easy. Coming from Temple, had a good good cut, uh, record at Temple. Actually beat South Florida this year. Uh, barely lost to UCF. Mm -hmm. You know, the big story behind UCF for the last two years. Beat South Florida, which Tech lost to this year. So, hey, we're... We're stepping up. Hey, big time. Somebody's going to make some money. Some realtor over in Atlanta is going to make some good money. We're stepping up. Jeff Collins, it's 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 going to be good to see. All right, current mortgage rates right now, 30-year. Rates are coming down a little bit, okay? 30-year uh, fixed rate average on, on the Freddie Mac Mortgage Market Survey. 30-year fixed rate average, 4.63. Well, that's lower. Okay, so that's looking good. 15-year, 4.07. Obviously not going to be as much movement there. Well, hold on, but that is lower than you had it a few weeks ago. Oh, definitely lower than a few weeks ago. I think uh, I think the business slowed down. Uh, markets, you know, stock market is changing. What I think is interesting, I really feel like we talked about this a little bit earlier today, but I think I feel like we're going to have a little bit of an early uh, market or early spring market next year. Well, I uh, hope that's the case. You know, anytime, and I know buyers and sellers will want to hear this because uh, buyers are frustrated with the houses on oh, the market. Sure. Sellers are probably, you know, sellers are probably not frustrated right now. It's December. They understand. But, uh, you know, we had a little bit of a slower market, I would say, over the last three months. There's been pockets. I was talking to somebody else today at lunch about, you know, it's kind of a sporadic market. It'll be busy for two to three weeks and then drop off for two to three weeks. So I think this uh, change in the, the slowness recently will increase the demand. And if rates can hold on a little bit, that'll help us in, I think, February, a little bit before the March-April typical season. As we roll into it, I mean, God, I, I, I surely hope that, that we have an early season because I think the market needs it. Yeah. Because we got because what we don't want to see happen is these buyers get so frustrated they don't want to enter the market as we come to. I mean, and I'm not talking. Of course, you're going to have some. I, we're not talking about that, but we want to make sure that we have a positive start to the year because I think it'll set the tone. Because interest rates, and we're going to talk about it in a little bit. The guidance that we're being given from the quote unquote experts. Uh, is that we are still headed higher towards the end of next year, right. possibly as high as 5.5%. Yeah, true. And I know we, we've got some things later in the show about uh, trends in 2019 for buyers and sellers that are, that's going to be interesting. But I feel like uh, you know if our rates can hang on, I think that right now people are a little frustrated. It's the end of the year. I think they're frustrated with the way things went this year as far as the inventory and interest rates. If they can just stay down here, uh, give people a little time to see that, notice that, come into January, you know, obviously – a lot of new things start up in January. A lot of people might be on well, It's going to be one of the biggest things uh, that I've been thinking a lot about was that we need to see some of these builders get back into that uh, starter home uh, construction, those type of things, if they can get it, because they should be getting deals on land, that sort of thing, in certain areas, because there's always a move-up buyer, right? I mean, right. in other words, everybody's got to start somewhere, and with these prices rising like they have, you, you've now, at the lower levels, pricing out of decent housing You've priced certain people at that level out, and, it, and and then it trickles up because that person that's already in that home wants to move up. They can't move. Yeah. It's a never-ending cycle. Yeah, and I feel like right now, a little bit, if you want to think about this, a little bit of the psychology behind, let's say, a 4.75 interest rate. Right now, people might be happy to be under 5, okay? 
Whereas before they hated 4.75. So that might change things a little bit too. That dynamic is going to continue to change as we move on. People still have reasons to buy, move up buyers, first time home buyers, family getting larger, whatever. You still got reasons to buy a home. Well, and I, home. I think too that at 4.8, listen, just like we talk about on the stock market, don't try to time this market uh, relative it's, to the interest rate. Yeah. It's You're going to kill yourself. Because uh, you know what? You told me over 10 years ago when I got my first loan with you. And one of the things he said was, uh, don't look at the interest rate tomorrow because I guarantee you it's going to be lower, right? It's just Murphy's Law, right? Right. Sure enough, <laughs> I remember. I think my last one I got with you was four, and I remember looking the next day it was like three point eight seven five. Ah, gum. What, what are we right. thinking, right? But it. But there's at the end of the day, neither one was going to kill but me. You're, yeah, and you're also you're also buying a house, so you're not going to be able to find the house and right. Y- y- it's not right. You find the perfect time with the rate, and then you go out. There's the perfect house. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's not going to work that way. It might be perfect for her. It's never perfect for me. Good well, price for me. Well, I want to move on to some uh, Birmingham real estate market numbers. So yeah. it looks like um, the sales, uh, this was in last month? Last month. This was November? November. So 1,142 single family homes sold. They did. And, and what was interesting about that is that inventory went down almost 9%, but yet we sold more houses. So we're out of balance, right? And we're going the wrong way. We're going we've the been, wrong way. We've been going the wrong way. We're going further in the wrong direction. Correct. So what we're seeing is that these houses are selling. They're selling for good money, but there's nothing to replace them. Right. And uh, if we we can't keep losing 10% of your inventory, right. are you going to be out of inventory? True. And so you get in a situation where the sellers aren't really wanting to sell because they have nowhere to go. Right. And that's a big problem. And, you know, a lot of times we hear people, and a lot of agents don't want all this new construction out there, but... We need houses, and they're going to fill the gap, and they're going to overprice for new construction. You oftentimes, I don't think, always get the best deal, right? Because he doesn't have to, because he has got demand on his yeah, side. Yeah, he's got demand, uh, so you're going to pay a little better price. But that new construction is also going to uh, help you on resale, right? Because it's going to be the newest thing around you, unless it's Absolutely. going to be a lot newer than what's around you right now. Well, certainly. Right. I mean, you look in our area, the Oak Mountain area, I mean... It's rare to find because you're, a lot of these areas are so, uh, uh, kind of like Vestavia has a circle around it of other cities. I mean, it's surrounded. It's landlocked except for their part they keep annexing. Yeah. Liberty Park areas, right? Yeah, but if you're yeah. wanting Vestavia proper, you're stuck. Yeah. Right? So they're not going to have new ones. But w- one thing to remember here, too, is the other part of that was the um, average sales price up 9% oh, year over year. You know, and the other thing that we we have seen too is that prices on townhomes and condos are becoming more affordable. Yeah, uh, which is interesting too. I mean, they're down about two percent. The other thing too to remember: I don't care whether you're here, you're in Auburn, where Ashley Miller is, you're where uh, Mr. Arnett right there is in Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, everything's Piedmont, hi- <laughs> Piedmont uh, Georgia. Uh, everything's hyper. What Piedmont we call Alabama. hyper oh, Alabama. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I don't. I don't hey, I the get, third time's a charm. Hey, we got it. I'm talking right over my, my own self. Uh, no, but one thing I want to make sure everybody understands is that real estate's so hyper local. Yes. Like you and I were looking at, earlier today at uh, the Oak Mountain area and the, uh, saw an increase of 11% in inventory. Yeah. Right? Where we said the market in general saw a decrease of nearly 9%. Yeah, so definitely there's going to be, uh, this, is, this is a generic average uh, numbers across all of Birmingham, but there'll definitely be different. Uh, numbers in different areas. Like you said, like in Vestavia, where there may not be a whole lot of room for new construction. There may be uh, in a, an area like Chelsea, where there might be more new construction. Or you could be over, or you could be in a Chelsea where you're over overbuilt and you have too many homes where you would say, oh, we can just keep building. Right? I mean, it, what I'm saying is that it can go either way in any city. Right. Yeah. I think you're right, though, yeah. in Chelsea. But and I think, and I think uh, yeah, and I think median days on the market, 17. Which is that? Is that kind of where? That's the median. Now everybody needs to remember that, where it's that been for the year. Or? Yeah, roughly. The, okay. the, what we want to talk about median is we're talking dead middle, and we're also talking about a lot of houses that were new construction that were one day that were input in the MLS as if they sold in one day. Right. That's ridiculous. They didn't go on the. You know, I mean, you, in, in mass to get a median number of seventeen, you have to have a lot of ones. Right. Uh, the the other thing, average is is you know is, is a lot is a little bit higher. So. Uh, Obviously, and the average because average takes all of them yeah. and divides. Great stuff. So, um, I wanted to share a story of a, a buyer, a young buyer that I talked to this week, and I just uh, you know this kind of stuff 
Uh, I was going to get on and just do a, a, a Facebook Live separately, but I, I saved it for this for the show. Hey, you're cheating. I, I know we talk a little bit about uh, credit all the time, but this kid was looking to establish his credit, okay? And he told me he had gone and gotten a, it's kind of like a payday loan. When you say kid, you're talking in their 20s? He was, yeah, he was early 20s. Of age, I mean, yeah. Yeah. get along. Yeah. So um, he was looking at building his credit. Cause I, talk, I was talking to him about his credit, where his scores are. You know, he gave me some information that he was looking at on Credit Karma. Um, so, you know, I'm asking him what type of loans he's got there. So he's got this payday loan. Okay, he went. He went to a company, payday loans uh, company in Bessemer, and I'm telling you guys, you can't do this. I know they're telling you to do it to build your credit. Uh, I have seen credit reports with three or four pages of these things where they'll go open them up, and then three or four months later they'll open another one. Three or four months later they'll open another one, another one, another one. So the loan was for a little over two hundred dollars. The total amount of the payments back over four months was two hundred and fifty bucks. <laughs> he's not paying, a lot of money. He's but... paying roughly. Uh, you know, I'm not giving you the exact numbers, but the the interest was about twenty percent over the four months. What was it? A APR though? Right, over about the year. sixty. Right? Sixty. So he's 60 paying plus. the equivalent. Of what we think of as sixty percent. Over sixty percent uh, APR. Mm -hmm. Um, and and he's not. He's not building his credit the right way. I'm telling you, building your credit is going to take time. You got to start early. Uh, we've said it before. Start with a credit card. Uh, don't use it up too much. And then six months later, go get another one. Okay? And stay around 30% of the credit limit. Just put gas on there. Put a little bit of but we put talked a dinner about on that. there or something like that. A lot of these, I even think some of the big players will give you what's called a secured credit card. Yes. And explain that a little bit. So, so what you would do is you'd go into your local bank, open up an account for, let's say, three to $500, and then they would give you a secured card. So you leave that, let's say, $500 in, their, in the bank. And then they will give you a secured credit card that's guaranteed by that five hundred. Now so they can't you, use that five hundred while they unless, have this card unless there's some. Yeah, right. The, the client cannot. That's correct. The consumer, right? But the bank has the five hundred guaranteed that the credit balance will be paid off. And that is the best way to do it. Yes, I mean credit cards are the best way to affect your credit score because it shows a, uh, it shows that you can manage using it. And then paying it off, well, using it, paying it off. Even a car loan is only, let's say, a car loan is two hundred dollars a month for forty eight months. We're just paying two hundred dollars a month. You know, credit credit cards establish a better understanding, a better responsibility for using credit. Well, and quite frankly, we're seeing a lot of folks out there. I mean, I can't tell you how it drives me them. bananas. I hate them that they are just because it has the Visa logo doesn't mean anything. That's the process. That's how they process the payment. It has nothing to do with your consumer protections. Right. Well, yeah, but I get I get tired of people saying that they don't want a credit card. Right. There's nothing wrong with credit. There's something wrong with you. Yeah. If you can't manage how to use a credit card, you're consciously making a decision. Yeah. To to limit your opportunities because you need you're going to need credit in your life. And remember, there's reasons we hear negativity. The the the, the uh, stores don't like them because they pay more. There are bad decisions made on credit cards. I'm not uh, not denying that. Well, no, but... But learn how to use them. Yeah, absolutely. But also, remember, I love what Clark Howard calls them. Fake Visa, fake MasterCard, you know. They're fake. They're, they're not real credit cards. And the other thing is, too, hey, you want to travel the world? Get you a good one and get some bonus miles and, and get you a yeah, good credit get card. Yeah, some perks. Um, yeah, and, and use it wisely if you, you know, if you choose to do so. That's great. But don't... And please don't go... Get payday loans. Don't get cash loans. Don't pay these 60, 80 percent. Look at that. Uh, think about how much interest you're paying. Look at those APRs. Uh, you know, you might get stuff in the mail and it's in the fine print. It'll tell you the <laughs> APR. Really? Yeah. You're supposed to read that stuff? Oh, man. Man, just do some homework or call me. I'll, I'll give you. He'll give you his referral code to his. Uh... <laughs> I'll give you my regular rundown of, of credit that I tell everybody. Oh, yeah. It's. it's it's not well, what's amazing so. to me, you know, you and I have been reading a lot about this lately for our personal finance stuff that we talk about, is we got to be talking to everybody about not utilizing. I mean, it's okay to, to put a charge it and then pay it off. But one of the problems we're finding is people are carrying balances higher than they have in years. Yeah. Because they felt confident going into yeah. this year. And, and, and let me tell you one problem with, with using and paying it off still is that credit card companies are only going to report – at a certain time of the month. So your balance, let's say you got a $10,000 card, and let's say you ring it up to 10000 every month and pay it off, and you might feel like that you're doing a great thing because you're, you're paying off your credit, and you are managing it well, 
But there's a chance that they report that when you have an eight or nine thousand dollar balance, and that's going to look like it's maxed out. That's why. Well, that's why I'm real big on we. I pay mine just so you know, because you know me about the credit card game, uh, playing to get the miles and everything else. But I'm paying it down all year, month long, so that when it comes to the end of the month, they really don't see much of a balance. Yeah. And but yet I've run thousands on it. Yeah. So at any point in time, it's not too high. When you have kids, yeah. it's easy to run thousands. Oh yeah. I mean, my God. They, uh, they don't mind spending it all the time, do they? No. Uh, your, dad, <laughs> yeah. your dad said, I'm not mature enough to have credit cards. <laughs> Sir, uh, <laughs> I, you like, got a good I'm teacher. Out. I'm out. I'm out of that game. That's right. Hey. That's funny. Hey, first step is knowing, right? That's right. I mean, so. Uh, so all let's right. say, what, what do we got next? We got four uh, trends that home buyers and sellers need to be watching out for as we head into 2000. And, 19. Yeah, right around the corner. What, just uh, three weeks or so, huh? We will. We will. And I tell you what, we will have, number one is we'll have more homes uh, for sale on the market. People are going to have to move still. That's one thing we learned even in the downturn. Everybody still had to move. And one of the biggest things you're going to notice is that a lot of the ones sitting are going to be the higher priced homes, the luxury homes. For us in, in Birmingham, that would be, what would you say, over 500 probably would fall into that category. I mean, uh, yeah, depending on where you're at, right? Well, we're talking about yeah. like the back area because here's the problem you got a whole generation of folks. I'm 40, you and I both are right, 42 years old, and you're not 43 yet, are you? Yeah, oh, okay, well, you're old, just barely. But anyway, that our parents' generation went into the back of Greystone, you know, behind the gates and mm -hmm. Legacy and mm -hmm. places like that. These were massive houses that were built on massive lots. Unfortunately, our generation doesn't want massive house with massive lot. We want, at, mi at maximum, a big house on small lot because I don't want to have to maintain and do all this right. stuff. And the problem is there's not enough people to take these houses that people spent a ton of money on. And so I think going forward, they're going to have to really think hard uh, as you're getting your house ready uh, of competitively pricing it if you want to sell. I love that. Well, I can't sell it for that. Well, that's, that's cool. You don't have to sell it for that. But you, you're not moving. Right. You're not selling it. You're not selling. You may move, too. Yeah, and, right? And, and you've got, you know, uh, plenty of houses that, like you're talking about, if they're on these big lots, the maintenance cost, if you don't want to do the maintenance yourself, can get expensive, too, right? I Absolutely. Mean, just, just the the yard care, uh, cleaning services, uh you know, uh, just main upkeep. Yeah, yeah, just basic upkeep. I mean, going into this year, we haven't really had to, you know, sellers really haven't had to worry about their competition very much. I think as we head into 2019, they are going to have to start looking at their competition. Am I better? Am I, you know, I was looking at one yesterday and, you know, uh, the buyer was asking me, well, why is this? One was at 440. These are both houses on two acres. One was 440 and the other one was 580. What's the difference? And it was over 2,000 square feet difference. Right, and they're going. Well, I don't really care about that. I don't, but I want the big house for four forty. And I'm like, well, me too. Yeah. Right. I mean, I get you. Yeah. But there's legitimate reasons, and and and, and so well, that's the, not logical. But yeah. what that seller that was at the higher price needed to do, they needed to be on their face, uh, marketing the attributes that did make them better than the competition, so they could justify the price without somebody having to dig to find that information. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's tough though when there's that big of a discrepancy, especially in in, in the size of a house. You would think that that would make sense and be okay with uh, most buyers and make sense in the market. But well, and I think too is is one thing. You know, the the news out of the Wall Street Journal this week was some of the guys are saying you know that we could be headed towards a real recession. And if we are headed to a real recession, what happens is a lot of those high paying jobs get cut back, they don't increase in price, they're not bringing new people in, and guess which part of the market gets hurt? I mean, it's not the low end that gets hurt on that, it's the higher end, and quite frankly, that's where you want to see your growth, because you're going to have natural growth at the lower levels. I mean, look, we can sell a $150,000 house all day. I mean, they're going to come on the market all the time. We've got people, we've got people wanting them getting older and moving into that, that absolutely you know that happens every year right absolutely but at the uh, but at the higher end you just can't just go they're not uh, you just don't have everybody just knocking the doors down right uh right as we see that and now some markets will see this worse than others obviously uh you know because we're not quite the mecca of luxury housing and right I mean, so there's some uh, somebody's in california and massachusetts we've, we've got uh, several fairway branches in massachusetts people doing business up there uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Hey, uh, Nashville, absolutely. Yeah. All right, what we got next? 
number two right here. It's a uh, affording a home uh, will remain tough, and you know it's. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting one because you know you got price pressure. Yep. Um, you know houses are still appreciating. They have been uh, what for the last eight years at least. We had we had a, a drop from eight to ten, but we've been probably moving. Absolutely. Straight up since then. We've been catching up with inflation, those yeah. type numbers. Yeah, so you've got that as well as, as interest rates. So you've got two things working against the affordability. And their jobs. Which making, yeah, and jobs is going to be the big thing with, with any type of recession fear. The unemployment numbers are going to change. Well, a good example is you're seeing a lot of, when I, one thing I've seen in our market is you got some people saying they're mid 50s and aren't ready to leave the workforce. They're getting laid off or whatever. And they're re-entering the workforce, but they're working, no offense to anybody working at Lowe's or Home Depot, right? But they were making, you know, seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, and now they're making 35000 Statistically, they're employed, mm -hmm. but they're not making what they were making. And so it's going to affect the affordability of them buying anything. Right. But they need to move. And, so, and I think we're going to see more of that as we head into the new year. Yeah, so you know, along with that, you, you've got the the mortgage rates. Hopefully, that will slow down. But there's a lot of people expecting them. Uh, you know, we've already kind of touched five percent. A lot of people expect them. You know, we just mentioned earlier four point six to move back in that five percent range, maybe up to five and a half. Uh, you know, they, there's all kinds of talk about the Fed and their funds rate, them moving rates around, and how many times they're going to move next year. But you know, there is also more talk about the Fed calming down and cooling off a little bit. And, and letting this economy play out a little bit more on its own. Well, and I think part of the craziness of this is for 10 years or more, you and I talked about the, oh, certainly the Fed's going to raise rates. Certainly they are, and they never did it. So I think, but I think the consumer got used to that head fake of artificially keeping them low, and they don't believe the Fed. Uh, as we, uh, we yeah. for those on the podcast, we, we, we have a light issue. Uh, it's a motion sensor that goes, oh, there it goes. We're back. Um, but the Fed is, is in a situation where they're actually doing what they say they're going to do, yeah. which was not the case. Well, and there's been a lot of uh, before a lot of scrutiny and criticism. But Donald Trump and Jim Cramer, uh, just the, the headlines that I read, uh, both going at it uh, on the side of the Fed doing too much, getting too involved, uh, moving rates up too much, which is obviously affecting... All of our rates. Well, and one of the best things I do think out of this Federal Reserve Board we're getting now is we're getting explanations that we didn't always get before, mm. good or bad. You may not like what he's having to say, but at least we're getting the rationale, and, and it sounds like he is willing to listen. Now, things are things are overall, they're still a lot better. We do have more equity in homes than we have in a while, right? Absolutely. So that'll give some homeowners uh, a little bit of relief, let's say. Um, give some sellers a little bit of profit. Uh, you know, to to turn around and maybe buy another home, even if it is absolutely, even if it's just uh, inflationary uh, profit. Now, one thing is next one, uh, the third one. Millennials will still dominate home buying as we move into the next year. Yeah, uh, yeah. Interesting. I, I thought it was very interesting. Um, biggest generational group of home buyers account for forty five percent of mortgages right now. Well. The, well, and one thing is, they're going to continue buying, and we just talked about the reason uh, of what will be a problem, and it will be a problem for that group, too, uh, because we need the millennials especially to be the move-up buyers. Right. Right. And so so a lot of them will be move-up buyers, but it also says uh, year 2020 projected to be the peak for millennial home buying. The bulk of them will be age 30. So 2020 would yeah, be the and peak of home buying. For if I'm correct, what millennials about 82 to 95 something there and there. Yeah, year -wise. yeah, we were talking about this earlier today. I think, yeah, uh, something like I, that. I don't remember, but yeah, Gen Z was running right in there around mm -hmm. 95. So, um, so it'll be interesting. The millennials, and they also are the most needy of the groups too. I mean, we see it every day. Well, I just think that there is just a lot more uh, information, a lot more available information, and I think people in general just feel like they can figure things out on them, their own. And, and you know, Google can tell you a lot of stuff, right? Yeah, Google can do a lot. They can even listen to But then to at you. the end of the day, you do need somebody to kind of kind of manage the process. Guide you through. Make sure, make sure everything gets done. Well, this is the big one. And this is probably the biggest one that everybody, I'm getting asked more, everybody knows I have a tax law degree. And they think, well, certainly he knows everything. Well, 
I tell my wife I do, but I really don't know everything. And this is the wild card for this next year, and that is the new tax law. Yeah, we won't find out until, you know... Uh, we won't be able to read the bill till we pass the bill. Yeah, May, June, July, <laughs> when... Uh, you know, sure, a lot of people get their taxes filed in April, and we'll find out what's going on and how it affects everybody. But, you know, a lot of people are, are going to delay and... and Put it off till May, June, July. Well, you know, so, I, I tried to download TurboTax the other day, and yeah. they were like, yeah, we really don't have the new forms yet. Yeah. And that is unusual. They usually have all that done now. I don't even know if the government really has that, knows what they're about to do. Well, so so we'll find out how this, this affects everybody. Um, I know that, you know, some of these, uh, the biggest thing was the, the standard deduction, right, which is obviously going to affect how you look at your mortgage because you may not be itemizing well, that mortgage we, interest. Well, most people are not. Not over ninety percent will not be itemizing as we go into this year. And I think the the we gotta retrain our mindset because it never made sense. You know all the people that told you, Hey, uh, I'm gonna buy a house so I can get that mortgage deduction or they yeah. used it as an excuse. It never was a good idea. It was a, just a side benefit. Yeah, a side benefit, but it's the only debt that gives you that benefit. It is. But it was never a reason to go spend money. It, you still needed a house. Yes. Yeah. See that, and that's the thing. Like you're, you're still spending money on a place to live. You're still spending money on a roof. If it wasn't a good idea, you shouldn't have done it. Like if, absent any anything else, if you if you couldn't afford the house, don't do it for the tax uh, tax well, uh, benefit. No, yeah. but people did that. Oh, yeah. I'm convinced. Yeah. Uh, because they talked about it every other time, right? I mean, so yeah. it was like, well, that is really ridiculous. Uh, you know, the the I mean, you're talking about renters. You know, they're talking about you know, renters will will not be affected either because they're not going to have to worry about it because they're most renters. I would virtue to say into the ninety six, ninety seven percent of them will be standard deduction. Oh yeah, going forward, there'll be a lot of standard deduction. Another big one is, um, you know. I guess for for people like myself who's W two, even though there's, I've always had a lot of business expenses in the past. You know, the W two wage earners are not allowed to itemize all those business expenses, so that'll change. Obviously, self employed people are still uh, itemizing expenses. But, but you you know, one area that, but uh, I, would, I would couple those business expenses along with the mortgage interest. So now I lost the business expenses. So well, I'll and, be even less. And if you're a high net income person and you're wanting to buy that second house now I, that's where i think that you could see some uh movement in the market to the downside is that person that says you know what the the narrow margins i have now say you're rent, a rental house at the beach i was getting that right off on that mortgage deduction you know what it's not worth it anymore if i'm gonna not make any money and i'm not getting any tax benefit i, can, right. I mean it's not that primary it's gonna be the problem it's gonna be those people and quite frankly they drive the market yeah, and I, and I got to remind people, you know, talk to a CPA about uh, filing taxes I, on, on, on investment property. I see people do it all the time. They put it on their, their primary. So they lose some benefits. They put it on their, uh, their I'm sorry, their individual tax returns. And they lose some benefits because they're just filing Schedule C and not taking those losses, whereas you could if you put it into an LLC or something and set that up a little yes, bit. Yes, we're We are going to find out. Hold on. Let me say one thing about that. He, he's talked because you brought it up. One of the dumbest things I ever see people do is, it's not dumb, but it's better to be honest with your mortgage broker up front, is if you're going to put anything in an LLC, go ahead and tell them, because theoretically, when you do that, you're calling your... What happens in a lot of these situations is they have, let's say, a lake house down at Lake Martin. And they say, you know what, I think I'm just going to go get me old quick claim deed, and what that means is just an easy deed, and I'm going to transfer it from Ethel and Bob to Ethel and Bob LLC. And what happens when they make that transfer, they have effectively transferred ownership of that property. And within the confines of, as you called it, the boilerplate of the mortgage, that note is now immediately callable by the bank if they catch wind. They could be, yeah. It's in the it's in the uh it's in the several pages that you just initial and and move on from. But yeah, there's uh definitely It's just uh, a risk that everybody yeah, needs to be aware of. Yeah. I mean how quickly are they going to find out that you did that? But either way, you know, if they do, it's not something just... You know, but, but Ethel's going to be mad at yeah, Bob if she didn't tell her the risk. Right. But a lot of these tax changes, we'll, we'll find out as the year goes on, update some people. Uh, so a little, a quick couple notes on the stock market. Been hey. volatile lately, huh? <laughs> volatile. It's yeah. been crazy. Crazy volatile. And we're, what, mid-December 2018 right now, so... Yeah, and I think, what, are we below 25000 
the market was uh, up a little bit today. So, okay, what, so what did yesterday? Um, I just thought it interesting. I did see one article today. One, this is one of Collier's favorites. Robin Hood, okay, yes. is now opening up a three percent savings or a three percent return on checking and savings accounts. Absolutely. So it's something to check into. Uh, obviously, mo- the highest typical yields on that are, are like less than one percent. Or up to 2%. Up to about 2%. But they can do this. Some online accounts are 2%. What did we tell everybody about three months ago? The banks were screwing you. They are making far more on the money. And it was, you know, that they were making. They were not sharing any of those gains back. Robinhood seems to be, because I got in line today, you know, got myself in line, uh, to get an account. They What they're doing is they're buying market share. Wouldn't you agree that they're going after the Schwabs of the world and these people that aren't offering much in yeah. terms of interest rate, and they're saying we're going to get some people over here? And right, and right now they really don't have a, a model for this that is profitable, and they say that's okay. Well, I think what they're trying to do is go at it like an Amazon and just you know offer something awesome, offer a great benefit, and they're hoping that they can make money off the millions of customers that they're going to draw. Okay, these accounts, one thing to note is they are SIPC insured, which is a little bit different because you're technically with a brokerage account. I think it's up to like $250,000 for cash. Uh, it's not FDIC insured. You can be, you can either be one or the other. So definitely uh, look that up uh, if you're looking into this or, or if you're interested in I mean, it. Robert, and, and one thing, too, you may, when you look at this Robinhood platform, because David knows I trade on there. That's where I trade my stock. Yeah, that, and that's how, free. They, that's how they made their name. Right. And so they made their name by the free trading. You get free trading. And you say, well, how do they make their money? Well, one way they make their money on the stock, why they can give it to you free, is they do the options and those type things is one way. But what you don't know is that they trade these stocks at a min- fraction of a penny more or less than the market rate. Yeah. Right? So, so they make that a little bit. And we're talking microscopic. Who benefits from that? You and me. It, who gets screwed by it is a mutual fund that wants to trade on their platform for some reason. Yeah, they're making a fraction of a cent on every dollar. On is, every dollar. That's what they said on the trading side. I don't, I don't think they've got a model yet. On this side. On this side for the savings, for the 3% savings checking accounts. But... I think if they if they draw enough people, if they get large enough, I think right now they're already valued about five point six billion, roughly. Don't quote me on that. Uh, they, it's big, and, and you know what? You know you're doing something right when the big boys are starting to go. Well, we really don't like these guys. Well, they created a trade. Uh, they created a price war with the commissions on these uh, online brokerage accounts. <laughs> yeah, you talk about really ticking people off. They're going, we're five ninety five. No, we're for, well, look, we're free. Well, look, you saw the same thing with Shave Club, right? As Dollar soon, Shave yeah, Club. Dollar Shave Club. As soon as they came out. Uh, Gillette changed their model, right? Started doing things differently. Well, they were screwing they're you for just, years. They're, they're, the profit margins yeah, were so they're, wide. They're finding, uh, let's say, holes or, or opportunities in the market, and they're they're kind of exploiting it, which will create a ripple, which will create change. Uh, you know, you see it. You, you saw a bookstore, yeah. right, turn into Alexa. Absolutely. And you know, the the other thing I'll say is if you're looking for a good pick this week, we don't have a lot, but what I will say is find a dividend paying stock or fund. I I like that these bond funds, these, uh, I like PCI, which is a PIMCO puts out a lot of funds. Yeah. Paying 8%, right? And so you're, you're insulated against the downside, right? Yeah. Just hang on, just hang on to what you've got right now and don't look at your year in statements. Don't worry about it. Just. Just tune in in 36 months. You'll be fine. And we'll put a link down below to Robin Hood. You get a, uh, and if you're on the podcast, we'll put it down in the in the, uh, in the the notes for the show as well. Uh, and so you can click through there. We all, I think we'll get a little nugget. You'll get a little nugget, a little gift from them. Because, uh, again, they're giving away the farm to build the farm. Hey, I think, I think they're doing a good job. They are, but... Uh, well, we certainly appreciate everybody stopping in this week, man. And I know uh, everybody wants to see that the the last, I think the last debut of the triple option at Georgia Tech will be uh, the 29th. I don't even know. Ah, the debut of the triple option. Oh, not the 29th. That's the Child's play Football Championship. 26th, I believe we play. Yeah, I mean, 26th. who is Alabama playing? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Boomer Center. And Kyler Murray stole that Heisman Trophy, huh? Stole it. You see his numbers? They Almost were. at th- what thirteen hundred more, and the kid, the kid's already got a contract to play baseball. 
Unbelievable. Which they five said, million dollar signing bonus, I believe. And I, I heard it. I heard his insurance was unbelievable, right? Wasn't yeah, it? Uh, yeah. And I loved hearing him talk about his coach uh, Lincoln Riley pushing him and making him a better person. I thought that was great. Man, look at you, kumbaya. I'm telling you. All right, we'll see you next Thursday, four o'clock. See you guys. Y'all have a great week. All right. Thanks so much. Have a good day.